firing line with William F. Buckley, Jr. and Dory Sherry. Tonight's topic, extremism. Well, Mr. Dory Sherry is well known in two worlds, one of them theatrical, the other ideological. He is by profession a playwright and producer and was for, for six years the head of the fabulous MGM Studios in Hollywood where he produced dozens of movies, including The Farmer's Daughter, The Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer, and other hits. He returned to Broadway in 1958 to write and produce Sunrise at Campobello and other successes. But in, in recent years, he has emerged as a figure of great prominence in the political world, uh, primarily in his role as national chairman of the Anti-Defamation League, an organization which some people, for instance, uh, myself, are believed to be engaged approximately as much in defamation as in anti-defamation. The uh, Anti-Defamation League, which is sponsored by the Benai Barith, understands itself to be in hot pursuit of extremism wherever it exists. In 1964, it sponsored a book called Danger on the Right, uh, whose thesis is that America suffers from a terrible national affliction, namely the conservative movement. The book makes, if only for the record, a distinction between what it calls the rabble-rousing right, for instance, Gerald L. K. Smith, or the radical right, for instance, Robert Welch, and the extreme conservatives, for instance, me. Uh, but somehow the distinctions have a way of blurring, and the reader emerges with the impression that what might roughly be called the Goldwater right is a collection of radicals and extremists whose exposure and resistance it is the sublime historical duty of the Anti-Defamation League to effect. We're here to talk about extremism, and Mr. Shari has insisted that we should talk about extremism on both the left and the right. So I'd like to begin by asking Mr. Shari whether he has any plans for writing or producing a book called Danger on the Left, Mr. Shari. Um, the fact is that I did that some years ago. I made a film comparing the techniques of uh, both the right and the left, <coughs> a film called The Hoaxers that dealt uh, I think quite effectively, was showing the uh, uh, kinship between the two in terms of technique. I think I should correct one point that you made. Uh, the book that you refer to did not uh, truly indicate that all those people who supported uh, Goldwater were radical writers. Uh, the point we did make was that the um, people who gravitated, some of the people who gravitated toward uh, Goldwater, happened to be members of the radical right in the same way that uh, sometimes very liberal candidates will attract the support of people much further left than they are. Uh, I understood from uh, what I've been told that what we really were going to discuss was extremism in the United States today. And I think uh, it would be helpful and perhaps a little bit more uh, purposeful if we were to avoid going back to uh, books that were written two years ago and discuss uh, what the perils might be in terms of extremism in the United States today. Gentlemen, we can pursue that point in just a moment. We may interrupt now, and we'll be back after this message. Mr. Shire, the, the fact of the matter is that the book Danger on the Right is still being sold by your organization. Uh, it's available in paperback, and it is being rather vigorously merchandised. If it's a book that you are now saying you're sort of sorry that you were once associated with, uh, I can certainly appreciate uh, that, that development in your moral sensitivity. I didn't say that. You but, did. Uh, <clears throat> uh, all right. In that case, uh, we must assume that uh, it is of continuing relevance if it's continued to be produced and merchandised. But if you find two years ago rather a long time, let me quote something that you wrote more recently, a few months ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, and ask you to explain it in terms of your now contention that it is wrong to assume that the Goldwater movement was classified by you as an extremist movement. You wrote, <clears throat> many Americans believed that the stern rebuke the national electorate administered to Barry Goldwater the following month in the 1964 presidential election spelled the death knell once more of right-wing extremism in our country, unfortunately, etc. Now, what do those words mean? You're a professional on the matter. Doesn't that mean that the right war, well, uh, the probably, Goldwater uh, movement was an extremist movement? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Uh, <clears throat> what it means was that we assume that with the defeat that the uh, radical right got, those members of the radical right who allied themselves to 
the respect uh, respectability of Goldwater's campaign. That the defeat they had might discourage them completely from again uh, trying to take over a convention as many people believe they did take over in 64. Uh, I think newspaper accounts and uh, other uh, contemporary historians will agree that the uh, delegates who came to the 64 convention were by and large uh, allied to uh, Barry Goldwater's cause <clears throat> and in the main they represented a far right point of view and men, uh, the conservative uh, Republicans, who tried to uh, get some order out of the chaos of that convention, or who did down, as you remember. And we had the feeling that perhaps then the Republican Party would recover from this kind of dominance. Uh, I believe very, very strongly in a, uh, in a powerful uh, Republican Party, a powerful conservative movement, because I believe that conservatism acts as a break uh, toward uh, liberalism that might run amok, just as liberalism uh, serves as a goad to uh, conservatism that might uh, just be willing to sit and be content with whatever gains we've made. Well, let me tell you something else that historians are going to discover, and that is that the people who nominated Goldwater were the same people who nominated Eisenhower uh, for the most part. That is to say, the actual delegates in San Francisco have been shown to be, roughly speaking, the same group of men and women Mm -hmm. uh, who nominated Nixon four years before and Eisenhower uh, four years before that. Now, there you, seems you, you, to be disagreement on that yes, point, Mr. Buckley, but I'll take that word. Yeah, now, word uh, under the circumstance, I'm, I'm interested in pressing the analysis because I do think uh, that your literature and a lot of literature that you have for some reason or other never called extremist mm -hmm. uh, seems to be taking the position that uh, a group of radicals dominated the Goldwater movement. Now, is this something that you, uh, th is this a statement that you're willing to endorse? The yes. extremists, quote, took over Goldwater? I think that they, uh, they influenced <clears throat> the convention, and I think they dominated a large part of the maneuvering at the convention. I'd be willing to rest on that, yes. Well, now, Cliff White, is he an extremist? Because he d did dominate the convention. That is to say, uh, he was in charge uh, of the convention, of the arrangements, and so on. Would you call him an extremist? Uh, no, I don't think that necessarily the man who runs a convention, just mm. as Paul Butler has ran in his uh, time, a few uh, democratic uh, conventions. I don't think that his philosoph uh, uh, political philosophy necessarily dominated the proceedings. He acted sort of as an agenda chairman and uh, ran the convention. Uh, I think it was the, um, it is the fact that uh, all the commentary, uh, all the commentators that I know of, uh, supposedly um, uh, nonpartisan uh, commentators, did make these observations all through the period that the uh, that members of the uh, far right were dominating the Goldwater uh, convention and philosophy. Well, you see, he, here I think uh, Mr. Shari is an absolutely classic example of the misuse of words, mm -hmm. uh, which you as, as a distinction maker uh, I think ought to be interested in. The, the difference between a dominate uh, and uh, a participate, there's no question about that. Some of the people in San Francisco were irresponsible, were wild, uh, made it difficult for proceedings to go underway. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, this evolves into, quotes, dominating the convention. And yet nobody has ever traced, uh, certainly not Theodore White, uh, uh, for mm -hmm. instance, in his book on the convention, uh, that uh, they in any way dominated Goldwater, that Goldwater took a series of positions which were in any way extreme. I didn't say that. Uh, Why do you use the word Buckley. dominate? I didn't say that in connection with uh, uh, Goldwater's campaign. <clears throat> I said that the far-right group dominated, I believe, dominated the uh, choice of Goldwater. And I think from that time on, they became very vocal because they felt they had a candidate who would um, tolerate their presence in the party. And I grant you that a political candidate often finds himself with very, very strange uh, bedfellows. It's true. But I think it would be... Um, who are you talking about? Who are you talking about that was going to be... A, a Accommodated by Goldwater, assuming that he I haven't, I haven't any idea who would be accommodated. <laughs> well, I haven't. Be I, I have only to ask me, and I'll tell you. <laughs> well, I have. I, I'm not interested in that point at the moment. I'm interested in pursuing the one point that you've brought up, and that is your attempt to deny the fact that Goldwater's candidacy did attract <clears throat> to his banner, whether yeah. he wanted them or not, uh, a number of yahoos and a number of crackpots and a number of far right people. I don't deny for a moment any more than, as you began the discussion by observing, 
uh, it would be uh, uh, any more than a realistic Democrat mm -hmm. uh, would recognize that he attracted a lot of yahoos of the fundamentalist left. Mm -hmm. But suppose the John Birch Society had written a statement after Adlai Stevenson was beaten in 1956 and said something like, many Americans believe that the stern rebuke the national electorate administered to Adlai Stevenson in 1956 spelled the death knell, death knell once more of the radical left extremism in our country. You'd write four or five books uh, uh, about that, wouldn't you? Except that in that instance, I think it would be highly inaccurate because while it would be true that, of course, Stevenson and his two campaigns did attract a number of the uh, far-left people, mm -hmm. uh, the people around him in the main and the people who supported him and spoke for him and articulated their support would be more classified in the liberal wing of the party rather than the extreme uh, far-left. But he, here I think we get back down to the nub of the problem, Mr. Shari. Mm -hmm. You tend to use the word liberal mm -hmm. with however its complement over on the right being radical or mm -hmm. extremist. You would call, say, Mr. James Wexler of the New York Post a, a quote, liberal, but uh, you would call uh, 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 myself or Russell Kirk an extreme conservative. I don't know what I'd call you. Well, your yet. books do, your, your <laughs> authors do. Uh, I don't know there's what a whole I chapter would. on, on, on uh, the ultra conservatives, mm -hmm. uh, uh, several chapters in your own book, mm -hmm. at least the book that your organization sponsored. Now, or do, do you regret? Uh, the rhetorical uh, uh, recklessness of Mr. Foster and Mr. Epstein? No, no, I don't regret it at all. You don't uh, regret it? It's no, all right that they I should don't be regret rhetorical. It. First extreme. of all, the book is not really sold um, or promoted by the Anti-Defamation League. It's true we have an interest in it, but the book was published by Random House, and if they're uh, pursuing its sale, I think they're pursuing it because they feel it's a marketable item. <clears throat> but in a book that deals with as uh, controversial and as tenuous a subject as the one we're trying to talk about today, I think it's almost uh, impossible to get a monitor point of view that would satisfy or completely uh, uh, complement someone who had a conservative point of view and someone who had a very uh, uh, different point of view. Whenever you do a book, a political book, that deals with, uh, with political attitudes and with uh, the stream of, uh, of uh, not conservatism, but the stream of uh, <coughs> radical political activity, you find yourself open to a lot of criticism. And undoubtedly, uh, when you deal with a book that has something like, I don't know, 3,500 or 4,000 facts, it is very possible that there may be some errors in those facts. And those errors, if there are any, uh, I would regret. I'm not talking so much about errors, uh, Mr. Shari. I'm talking about attitudes and evaluations. For instance, if I wrote a book in which I said uh, there are, uh, there is a considerable left-wing threat. For instance, there is uh, the Communist Party mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Mr. Shari. Mm -hmm. uh, this this would be, wouldn't you agree, uh, a kind of a tour de force in which I attempt a rhetorical amalgamation mm -hmm. intending to smear you with the Communist That's been Party's done, brush. Mr. Buckley. Yeah, That's I'm, been I'm done. Sure it, I'm sure it's been done, and I'm sure you regret it. But I don't know that I have ever seen you regret the victims of your own slurs of this kind, or at least of the organization of which you are the national chairman. No, if... Uh, uh, l l let me say this. I've tried to live my life uh, not hating anyone. I hate ideas. Uh, I don't believe you can hate any group of people uh, in the plural. And I find myself not even hating a man who is uh, a vulgar and obscene anti-Semite, like, let's say, Gerald K. Smith. I hate what he stands for. In a discussion, a public discussion of uh, these kind of attitudes, it's almost inevitable that you might occasionally say something harsh and you might be victimized by other people saying something, something harsh. But in connection with the uh, activities of the far right, as they affect the work of the Anti-Defamation League, I think you have to be aware that in America, the greatest threat, and after all, we are essentially a Jewish organization, though we are pledged to support as much as we can the work of all minority groups, our basic concern still remains the security of the Jewish population. And unfortunately, the radical right, the far right, have so often dealt with um, 
incipient anti-Semitism that we view them with great alarm. We're very, um, we're very conscious of it, very apprehensive of it, because we have lived through a period of time where we saw that such a cause, under the guise of being anti-left, turned out to be a vicious tragedy for us. I couldn't agree with you more. And Gentlemen, may we interrupt mm -hmm. again for just a moment. We'll continue this discussion after this message. Uh, Mr. Charry, I, I couldn't agree with you more that the, the historical role of the Anti-Defamation League has been a useful one, uh, and it has been one that has, has sought to uh, isolate uh, and expose uh, anti-Semitism. But it, it is also a fact uh, that the Anti-Defamation League itself, you, for instance, in your own introduction to the book we were talking about, have announced that the Anti-Defamation League has a whole series of goals. In fact, it's taking positions on progressive education. It's taking a position uh, always urging the secularization of the schools. Uh, and it has taken a, a, a whole series of, of positions on matters of public policy that are utterly unrelated to the question of anti-Semitism. And I think one of the reasons why some of your victims feel especially resentful is precisely because a lot of people feel that if somebody is criticized by the Anti-Defamation League, it must be because they are latently anti-Semitic. Uh, and there's, there's a great deal of that that slurps over uh, as a result of, of I think, the, the indiscriminate objectives of, of your uh, organization. Now, you say that you're a... Uh, May I just answer sure, that? Sure, uh, sure. I don't believe those, uh, uh, those issues are necessarily uh, unrelated to the work of the Anti-Defamation League. There are some public issues, such as uh, the secularization of uh, schools, that uh, are related very definitely. We see certain danger signs. We see certain danger signs, for instance, in connection with the um, civil rights movement. One of the reasons we became involved in the civil rights movement was that we felt there should be a uh, deepening acceleration on the part of the uh, American public to a recognition of what the problems of the Negro were. We knew that if any minority group here in America is kept isolated and disadvantaged and uh, uh, chained to a uh, <coughs> situation that should have been uh, rectified a hundred years ago, that inevitably that kind of uh, problem would affect us as uh, Jews. We felt very, very sincerely, uh, for instance, in the case of the Nisei's in California, when I was living in California, there was an issue that came up involving a veterans organization, which was keeping Nisei's out of their chapters. We felt very strongly that we should take a public position and fight very hard to get these men, uh, veterans of uh, the uh, war, into these uh, posts, because we felt by doing this we were ensuring our own security. So then I guess it would be a matter of opinion and certainly a matter of debate uh, as to whether these subjects with which we have involved ourselves are related to our work or not. Well, uh, there's a sense uh, in which, I suppose philosophically, you can relate everything to everything. Mm -hmm. There is a reticulation of some way in which uh, uh, you can join uh, oranges and gaskets. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, when the Anti-Defamation League comes out for Medicare, for instance, I think it's awfully hard to trace that back to anti-Semitism. No, but I don't think we have <laughs> come out for Medicare. Well, uh, I think uh, you're, you're going a little I, too far. I can introduce <laughs> some of your own, your own literature in which... I uh, doubt Medicare. Uh, in, well, practically every social program that has been uh, backed by the New Deal and the failure and so on forth has received, uh, uh, at least inferentially, the backing of the Anti-Defamation League. But now, here's one of the reasons why it's awfully hard to discuss these questions, Mr. Shari, is because uh, you, 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 you have been, I think, so amiable, so, so reasonable, so soft-spoken. But, uh, but when you get on the typewriter, it sort of comes out different. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, extremism follows patterns in the emotional, emotional nature of its appeal, in the paranoid style of its propaganda, in the semi-secret apparatus it seeks to establish, in the admittedly dirty tactics it employs, in its eventual divisive effects and its ultimate danger to the Republic. This is you. Yes, I, 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 and, and I would say, say it again about all extreme <clears throat> groups. Yeah, uh, but in fact, you haven't said it since whatever movie it was you produced a generation ago. Oh, I, I have said it. Yeah. I've said it publicly. What, what have you said about the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, for instance? I, have, I have talked publicly about the Fair Play for Cuba. Have you ever I published anything to it. about it? No, nobody's ever asked me to write anything about it, but I have written things for the Anti-Defamation League. We have a whole... Maybe they don't publish the good things. No, write. no, no. We, we've had a whole history of uh, anti-communist uh, literature. No, I don't talk about anti-communist, because that's safe. We can all be anti-communist. Yes. 
It's like being anti-Ku Klux Klan. I'm talking about communist front groups. We've, we've been I'm, articulate I'm, I'm, about those two. About women's strike for peace, for instance. Or what about SNCC? Have you ever done anything about SNCC? About I don't think the, SNCC... some of its anarchistic tactics? And no, I don't think SNCC is a, uh, is a communist group. I think they're elements No, I didn't say it was. No, I said I, something that isn't a communist group, yes. but is, uh, quote, extremist. Now, uh, even Whitney Young and Roy Wilkins will tell you it's extremist. Well, we but, have, but, uh, I've declared myself on that, too. Sometimes, not everything I say, you see, gets into print, uh, Mr. Which Parker. is in itself interesting, because that's it why you're a very high-paid writer. <laughs> No, but I sometimes can't command the press. I don't. Uh, I sometimes wish I had a column you, you as you did, so I could I could have a wide spread of everything I have to say. I know it's been very hard for you to reach the public uh, through, in through certain the last hundred movies. <laughs> in certain issues. Yes. Uh, uh, but wh why why doesn't, um, you, for instance, you say almost ritually we are against the extremes on the right and the extremes on the left. Now we both agree that we're against the communists, we're against the Ku Klux Klan. But then what becomes interesting? is the pro processes by which a particular organization becomes extremized. Mm -hmm. uh, in my judgment, uh, the book that you um, published two years ago had the effect of saying that the Goldwater Movement was an extremist movement. Uh, and I I'm wondering uh, why the Anti-Defamation League seems almost uniquely and exclusively obsessed with various permutations of extremism coming in from the right and, and not from the left. We why, are why concerned about it, though. And as a matter of fact, though uh, I imagine you will think that this is a, uh, a project we started yesterday, but the fact is that we have been working for a period of about six or seven months trying to accumulate as much material as we can on the so-called new left, trying to analyze uh, just how much of it is uh, communist-inspired, just how much of it represents uh, an exacerbation of the problem that the Negro has had in America. Uh, how much is justified, how much of it is truly uh, left-wing, and how much, it, how much of it represents other causes. In the same way that in examining the uh, so-called new left, we've been interested in and been doing research on the expressions of dissent in connection with Vietnam, on the question of uh, protests in colleges. It's a complex issue, as you know. Not all of the protests against Vietnam not all of the uh, expressions of dissatisfaction in uh, colleges are um, communist-inspired. Uh -huh. uh, large, no, quite a number of them are uh, anarchical. Uh, some of them are purely pac pacifist. Uh, we would agree, I'm sure, that a large part of this is stimulated uh, by the Communist Party, whether it's the party of uh, Moscow or the party of Pekin. But uh, we have been working on this, and we hope to be able to publish something uh, very soon. Yeah, well, I, 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 I'm glad that you are, and I'm glad once again to see you making these distinctions. You, you just instructed me in, in what I, of course, know, that not everybody who was opposed to the Vietnam War is a communist. Uh, but, uh, for instance, uh, in one of your works here, you refer to the America First movement mm -hmm. uh, as the radical right. Mm -hmm. Now, is it your position that everybody who opposed that war was an extremist, but oh, not everybody no. goes, this war was What do you say? No, 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 I doubt, because the America <laughs> First Movement, there were people who opposed our going into war yeah. who were not members of the America First Movement. Yes. Oh, but do you think that the America First Movement uh, was a radical right? Or maybe uh, you, did, you did say it right here. Uh, yes, I'm inclined to think yeah. the America First Movement represented a uh, radical right uh, thinking, yes. Uh, you realize that there were about 30 or 40 senators uh, who belonged oh, to yes. it and a couple oh, hundred yes, congressmen and so forth. I know that. So uh, they, they were radical right. Some of them. But uh, Some of them. That's what I said. I okay. said I think the organization was essentially radical right, but obviously there must have been people who joined the America First group who were not radical right. Well, yeah. Uh, obviously they're, they're non-communists in the Kremlin, too. In, you say in the middle 30s... I'm not so sure of that. The new, extremist, uh, uh, new, new extremism... Uh, uh, as it, it appeared as the Cochlin movement and flowered into the reactionary America First movement. That, that's the kind of thing mm -hmm. that sends me up a tree mm -hmm. because uh, I know an awful lot of people who were in the America First movement. Uh, uh, Jessup was a, a member, Chester Bowles was a member, Norman Thomas was very, very, very close mm -hmm. to it. Uh, uh, it had the largest membership of any organization, uh, any recent organization in American history, but all of a sudden I read uh, in your texts that I, I'm supposed to consider it as a flowering of the radical right extremism of the 30s. Heaven only knows what you had to do the, to the Goldwater Movement in your next book, view, view, viewing it historically at this rate. Uh, so well, you do understand why people are a little bit edgy uh, uh, about your organization. 
yes, I can understand why they're a little bit edgy, and I think some people are edgy with perhaps uh, uh, in good conscience, perhaps yourself. But I think there's some people who are edgy who have no reason to be edgy except the fact that they have been exposed. Uh, you are concentrating in your um, uh, attacks on the book in the areas that might very appropriately be called gray. You are not concentrating on the areas in the book which deal very specifically with people who ally themselves. Not. Why should I criticize things that shouldn't be criticized? Uh, I don't know why yeah. you should. Yeah. <laughs> you should. Well, it, it, but it's you're, rather silly. But I, you're not I, I don't, the I don't point. say to you, Mr. Sher Sherry, you concentrate only on the weaknesses of the John Birch Society. Mm -hmm. You never mention uh, uh, its strengths. I don't uh, think it has any strengths. Uh -huh. I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> yes. Gentlemen, we'd like, to, we'd like to take just a moment at this time. We return after this message. You, you say that uh, the John Birch Society has no, no, no strengths. No, not in my opinion. Uh -huh. Well, uh, what objection would you have, for instance, to uh, the leadership of the John Birch Society saying you should familiarize yourself with your congressman, your senator, find out how he votes? Is, there's nothing wrong with that, is there? No, nothing at all. So that's, that's what, if your organization did that, we, we would have to call it civic-mindedness, wouldn't we? Uh, no, <coughs> no. Not. Not, if, not if our organization uh, had as hysterical <coughs> a program, as the John Birch uh, program appears to be, articulated by its leaders, I think an organization such as the John Birch organization that attacks uh, every recent president we've had, that attacks uh, Justice Warren, that attacks our congressman, that attacks an administration and the clergy and the military as being uh, uh, part of a communist conspiracy, uh, I think this organization is a uh, irresponsible organization. Oh, I do too. I think it's, it's cuckoo. And, uh, uh, at least I think Mr. Wells is cuckoo. But uh, that really was, wasn't what, what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, on the one hand, the making of distinctions when they are convenient. On the other hand, not... No, no, it isn't a question of convenient. No, it isn't... Uh, you you no, knocked no. me a moment ago <laughs> for not mentioning those, those yeah. chapters in your book devoted to the conventional scurrilities of the KKK mm -hmm. and uh, Gerald L. K. Smith and so on. Yes. Well, the answer is I didn't mention because I agree with them. I think anybody right. agrees with them. But I, but I, I find, my, find myself uncomfortable between the same covers of a book that includes me and Gerald K. Smith. Yes, but, but, but we're not... Well, you no, find no, very easy to no, understand. No, no, I, I don't find that easy to extend. We were talking about the John Birch Society. Let's finish that off for a moment. Mm -hmm. It is true that you have to make certain distinctions. Mm -hmm. And while it is a, um, a good uh, point of debate to say, well, if we would do it, it would be civic-minded, if they do, <clears> it would become yeah. something else. You then have to get certain standards. Yeah. And uh, the Anti-Defamation League, with whatever other criticisms you may have, does not go off on a program that attacks our entire government, our entire judicial system, our entire legislature. We simply don't do it. <laughs> well, it it is a responsible attack. It, it depends and on there may be, at there what may point. Yeah, I, I happen to feel there's much more similarity between our government and our judicial system and our legislature. Uh, as understood and defended by conservatives and as understood and defended by you, because you are uh, a Democrat mm -hmm. uh, and you are a progressive Democrat. And in fact, you may call yourself, all I know, a left-leaning Democrat. You like the Supreme Court when it is doing roughly what you think it ought to do. I like it when it's roughly doing what the what founding fathers thought it would do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, there's uh, reason, mm. there, there, there is reasonable debate in our political system. I don't for think it's that. very reasonable the way you go after it, though. Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, you're uh, going I, back to something else. You're yeah. now going back to extremism. Mm. I'm talking about the reasonable uh, reaches of political opinion. Yeah. And right. I think there is reasonable debate. A, a, a conservative point of view is expressed by a Robert Taft is a, a reasonable debatable point of view. And uh, liberals, I know, had enormous respect for this man. And granted, what he was doing to our, um, uh, to our system was aerating the goods and the bads. And I'm all for that. I think the public debate is marvelous. Well, is it, is it reasonable for uh, Mr. Israel Morse, the director of the ADL, to have said to the newspapers when Dr. Fred Schwartz came to Madison Square Garden, which director that is he? Quotes, uh, he was listed in the New York Times as a director of the ADL. Now, this was four years ago. Yeah. Uh, quotes, uh, the American people have no need for the rantings of the extreme right, the latter-day professional anti-communists, who charge as much as $250 for admission to a Madison Square Garden rally. Mm -hmm. Now, um, it was $250, by the way, for a box of 18 people, mm -hmm. the sponsors of the thing, uh, just as you have your affairs, in which uh, it's $100 a seat. 
But now, oh, oh, is, is it responsible for your representative to refer to the, quote, rantings of Fred Schwartz? I, I don't know that he's ever ranted. Or, I'm not sure that... Or the latter-day profession. Yeah, but I'm not sure that this is a, uh, <coughs> or this was a paid employee. I don't know. I don't know. When you say he's director, uh -huh. he couldn't be a director. Our national director is uh, Benjamin Epstein, and has been for many, many years. Now, I, I uh, will have to grant, just as probably you would grant, that the many spokesmen on your side who say some things sometimes that uh, you could edit. Not a national review. <laughs> well, <laughs> you have a magazine to edit. Uh, I don't edit everything that is said. Um, I don't know of this uh, quote. I've not seen it before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I were writing it, I could edit it and perhaps make it um, less forensic. Uh-huh. Less something, yeah. Mr. Now, Mr. Arnold Foster, however, you... You haven't uh, dismissed, have you? No. Uh, and it was Mr. Foster who refused even to talk to Dr. Schwartz. Yes, there was a good reason for that. Uh, what was it? At least in his, <clears throat> from his point of view. Uh, Mr. Schwartz was attempting at the time to uh, receive, in effect, the imprimatur of the ADL. Uh, we felt that we did not want to become associated with the uh, Schwartz anti-communist crusade. And... Uh, at that time, Arnold Forster, as he explained it to me, uh, said that he felt he was going to be used, and he didn't want to be used, and he didn't want the ADL to be that used. That would be in a historical that, rehearsal. <coughs> it might be. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, but uh, that's the reason uh, why. Well, now, Miss, the Dr. Schwartz is half Jewish, mm -hmm. and uh, rumors were circulating around New York that he was anti-Semitic. None of it came from the Anti-Defamation uh, uh, League. I'm sure it didn't. None of it. I'm, None I'm of sure it. it didn't. But Never. who, if not the Anti-Defamation League, uh, has the prime responsibility for looking into those rumors and, and performing some of that justice that you want performed on behalf of everybody else. We try to perform that justice. No, we I, never I accused him. Uh, without even giving him a hearing, mm -hmm. and if McCarthy had done anything of the sort, you all would have jumped into the East River in frustration. But the Anti-Defamation <laughs> League never accused him of any such no, thing. No, it didn't, but it knows that other people were accusing him of it because it was all over New York. That this there were inquiries, there were inquiries you know, about uh, and, and who Mr. Not Schwartz. And if your organization should have looked into it? Well, we did. Uh -huh. And that's why I'm telling you, uh, as far as we were concerned, he got a uh, clean bill of health on the business of being anti-Semitic. And an answer, to inquiries, yeah. now, an answer to inquiries, uh, we made that position very, very clear. Mm -hmm. Now, there is an action going on uh, now somewhere in the United States, a court action revolving uh, Mr. Schwartz and someone who I don't know. And uh, on the business of his being anti-Semitic. And on that basis, I frankly, for a number of reasons, would ri rather not discuss any more anything about Mr. Schwartz. But well, I'm telling you officially uh, yes. what our <clears throat> position was. Yes, I, and I'm certainly not anxious to discuss whether he's anti-Semitic, because I know he is. No, he's not. And even to open up the question is in itself a form of mm -hmm. a slur. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, but these slurs, as you know, do come up in uh, public life. I remember years ago, again in California, during the first uh, Eisenhower campaign, there was a... Um, nasty rumor in connection with uh, Vice President Nixon. And at that time, uh, it may interest you to know, I wrote the statement uh, making very, very clear uh, the objection of the entire Jewish community in Los Angeles to this charge and um, clearing Mr. Nixon in any way and attacking uh, this kind of technique. It's used in all sorts of campaigns. Sure it is. Sure it is, sure it is. And, I think and it's, it's regrettable, exactly. and it's, it's an indication, again, of the uh, extremism that we're, uh, we're facing today. In times of stress, uh, people become extreme in their opinions, in their attitudes, and in every form of their life, and we're certainly living through that yeah. now. And I think it's admirable that you take the position you do, uh, and, but especially puzzling under the circumstances that there seems to be this, this running incongruity between your own uh, sanity and fairness uh, and, uh, and, and the excessive statements of people that you uh, associate with and, and uh, in some way are responsible for. Incidentally, do you think it is wrong or extremist to be a professional anti-communist, quote-unquote, a phrase that appears repeatedly in the no. literature of the ADL? No, I, no, I don't think that. Profession? No, I no. It's a profession. No, I don't think, uh, uh, again, it's probably uh, nomenclature you can dis debate. It's the same way that people uh, on the... Uh, on the other side might say a professional anti-fascist. Uh, these are things that are used indiscriminately by many people. 
I don't know what you're referring to specifically when you say a professional anti-communist. Well, the fact that Schwartz was denounced as being a latter-day professional Yeah, but that's not a statement of the anti-defamation. Well, he was league. by a director, according it to It can't Ohio, be. It, it just was. can't be. He may be, he may be a, a lay leader in connection with the organization, or he may be employed at that time, but really, I don't know that statement. Yeah, but on the other hand, the phrase does occur. It's, it's not sharing in, in, this, in this book. In this I book, would right? never use it and would uh, never, um, as, far, if, if, as far as I could control it, I'd never use it. Uh-huh. But uh, uh, do, do you believe that there is room in America for professional anti-communists who are not necessarily the employee of the government? If you, yes, if you're talking about the term yeah. professional in its pure sense, yes, sir. rather than the sense of someone who is making a living out of being anti-communist for his own gain, not really with the high motive in mind. Well, uh, 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 I don't see why, why, that, why one shouldn't make one's living by resisting a system whose success no, but, no, no, you, up in aborting... No, you, you, you're being a little captious now. You know very well what I mean. You know I'm talking <clears throat> about the kind of man who allies himself to a political cause with no deep convictions of his own. Oh, you mean a cynic? That's right. Well, I would much rather be defended by anti-communists who believed in it, but uh, uh, short of the availability of those, I wouldn't care whether you're cynical or not, provided he was an effective anti-communist, would you? The point Gentlemen, I think I will. I'll return I think for I further will. discussion in just a moment. I think I would. Gentlemen, at this time we have a number of questions submitted by our viewers. Each one will be directed specifically to one of the other of you, but should your opposite number care to comment on what has been said, feel free to do so. This question is directed to you, Mr. Sherry. There has been considerable talk about Mr. Forster's refusal to shake hands with John Russelo, the public, direction, public relations director of the John Birch Society. Is Mr. Russelo an anti-Semite, or does the ADL have something on him which uh, indicates that he is socially intolerable? No, uh, they have nothing on him at all. Uh, according to Mr. Forster, uh, when he was uh, first approached by Mr. Russelo to shake hands with him, uh, there were photographers and a number of other people, and this was just before they were to debate on the Today Show. I think Yes, the Today Show. And uh, Mr. Forster felt that these pictures showing them, perhaps showing them in a moment of congeniality, uh, might appear to be interpreted differently uh, than he wanted them interpreted. He did shake hands with Mr. Russelo after the show was over and after the press had left. That's in connection the story, with the, in that's connection the, story with the first Mr. Part of the Foster. Question. That's the story Mr. Foster told. In that case, there was no evidence oh, of any anti-Semitism. No, no. Mr. Buckley, do you have a comment, sir? No. <clears throat> this next question is directed to you, sir. Since 1962, you have periodically attacked the John Birch Society for what you consider excesses on the part of the organization. Now, do you see any hope for any reconciliation between its membership and the legitimate right of which you were said to be a leader? Uh, not, not for so long as Mr. Welch is its principal policymaker. No, sir. Mr. Sherry, anything to add? I can only um, say that in this uh, question, Mr. Buckley and I find myself in total agreement. All right, we'll direct a question to you, sir. Uh, in your foreword to the ADL's report on the John Birch Society, you pose the question, is the John Birch Society truly American? Now, by what criteria do you judge an organization to be truly American? Well, we like to believe that we um, judge it on the basis of what its objectives are. And um, its objectives were, to, in our opinion, so muddied so irresponsible, its spokesman so hysterical, its attack so ill-considered, its uh, entire program so injudicious that uh, we felt that this could not exist as a political instrument in uh, the American concept of things. This was our approach to it. Is there anything you care to add, Mr. Buckley? Uh, uh, only that I think that uh, Mr. Uh, Sherry's uh, condemnation is over a categorical uh, I think that uh, the overwhelming uh, uh, number of the objectives of the John Birch Society are one with which, for instance, I would uh, 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 gladly enthusiast and enthusiastically support my, uh, uh, align myself. What, uh, what is, in my judgment, wrong with the John Birch Society is its analysis, its analysis of what it is that has caused uh, the diminution of freedom in our century uh, is, in my judgment, profoundly wrong and profoundly misleading. So it's not its objectives, but rather its analysis that uh, oh, I find intolerable. We, uh, we have a question directed to you, Mr. Buckley. In supporting the blood donation to the Viet Cong, 
Would you then say that Senator Robert Kennedy has now qualified himself as a left-wing extremist? Well, I think that Senator Kennedy, uh, uh, in, in volunteering, whatever it was, a few months ago, to say that he would himself be glad to give blood to the Viet Cong, uh, simply ran away uh, with himself. Uh, it was a, uh, a, a thoughtless, a sentimentalist uh, 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 act of uh, 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 sort of a Boy Scout uh, effusion, which he himself, I gather, likes not to be reminded of, because uh, in fact he hasn't taken any steps to uh, to send his rather precious blood uh, to get <laughs> and, and I, I don't think he will. I think it was simply thoughtless, and that it is wrong to construct a theory of Senator Kennedy around that unfortunate uh, statement. Mr. Sherry, would you care to add anything? Well, I would only add this, that I think it's very possible, for instance, on a field of combat, that uh, soldiers fighting each other, in a very peculiar way sometimes, soldiers who are deadly enemies, find themselves admiring each other's courage and helping each other out of difficulties. I think it's very possible that an American soldier, uh, well and strong, at a uh, base hospital might find himself being asked by a um, doctor if he would give blood to a wounded enemy. Mr. Shorey, we're talking about Possibly. different things. Possibly. Nobody's talking about we're whether talking or not we have, a, we, ha we have a continuing responsibility under the Geneva Accord yes. to retrieve the uh, wounded of the enemy and give them the same kind of hospital care that we would give our own soldiers, which is, however, different mm -hmm. uh, from collecting blood to ship uh, to uh, the center, uh, to the centers of military action of that enemy, blood being a, 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 an awfully precious ingredient mm -hmm. uh, in, in the making of, of warfare. So let's, let's distinguish between helping out their wounded, yeah. which not only Senator Kennedy is in favor of, but I'm in favor of, and you also, uh, and the other rather more startling thing that he in fact came out for. Mr. Sherry, this next question is directed to you. The uh, ADL has frequently allied itself with the reformist wing of the Democratic Party, uh, informally, if not exactly formally. Uh, how then do your colleagues look upon your high position in the present campaign staff of the gubernatorial aspirant, Mr. Frank O'Connor, who is regarded as the candidate of bosses Buckley and Steinke here <laughs> in New York? Uh, well, number one, uh, before I took on this uh, uh, responsibility, or a short time after I took on the responsibility of working for Mr. O'Connor, I took a leave of absence as chairman of the Anti-Defamation League so that there would not be a... Uh, conflict of interest. I might find Mr. O'Connor perhaps saying something that would be in direct contradiction with the point of view ADL had, and I didn't want to find myself or the organization in that position. Uh, there's a part of the question that should be answered. Uh, it is not true that the ADL membership, by and large, has been allied to the reformer branch of the Democratic Party. There's some members who are reformers, some members who are liberals, some members, uh, and quite a number, who are Republicans. And uh, it represents a, um, <clears throat> a cross-current and a cross-section of American political opinion. I'm sure there are some members who probably, uh, some members of the Anti-Defamation League who uh, might disagree with my position. But I faced this before in my uh, political interests. When I worked in uh, California at a studio, I found myself uh, at odds with some members of my board of directors who felt that as head of a studio, I should take no public position. I had a feeling at the time, since all of them were, or the group that I worked with were all Republicans, that they wouldn't have objected if I had had that point of view, but they objected to the fact that I happened to be a Democrat. Mr. Buckley, do you have anything to add? Very well, here's another question for you, sir. The Republican Party has taken official action to rid itself of what it considers the extremist influences, specifically the John Birch Society. Now, as a Republican, do you support such action? Well, I, I find it impossible to answer your question in that formulation because the Republican Party has never conceded that it is influence. So how can it remove something that never existed in the first instance? Uh, what the Republican, what certain Republican officials uh, have, uh, have consented to do uh, is to uh, state publicly that they do not seek uh, the support of the John Birch Society which in a sense is a venture, a venture in redundancy 
because I don't see that it was ever clear that they did uh, seek the support of Mr. Robert Welch. Uh, the support of Mr. Robert Welch being, uh, as we all know, a negative asset by, in, in, in terms of, of, of modern uh, 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 politics. I think that the Republican Party has been a little bit outmaneuvered by the polemicists uh, of the left, be primar primarily because the polemicists of the left have far, far superior rhetorical firepower and would like to see the Republican Party uh, engage in a series of, uh, of renunciations and disavowals, uh, which uh, as a result, as I say, of this unique power uh, of the liberal critics, uh, they are able to, uh, uh, to inflict without, for some reason, causing anybody to consider whether or not there isn't a complementary obligation by uh, the Democratic Party to uh, uh, resist uh, the Americans for Democratic action. On the other hand, if they would do so at this point, it would hardly depopulate the party, so they pro probably can't afford <laughs> Mr. Sherry, <laughs> will you <coughs> add or detract anything to that? <laughs> uh, no, I, I was just going to say something Mr. Buckley mentioned, however <laughs> he mentioned different terms. Uh, I was going to say the Democratic Party finds itself very often under the rhetorical firepower of spokesmen such as Mr. Buckley, and they find themselves having to defend the company of certain uh, people who ally themselves to the party in the same way the Republican Party is put on the defensive under attacks uh, regarding the Birch Society. Um, I do think that it would be a healthy thing in politics if um, there was perhaps a, um, a clearinghouse of names that you were allowed to call each other so that people wouldn't get off recklessly um, uh, using name calling purely for political profit. All right, we have one further question for you, sir. You have been quoted as saying that the timing of the publication of Danger on the Right was purely accidental, that it was mere chance that it appeared when it would be most damaging in Mr. Goldwater's presidential candidacy. Now, if the ADL was not nonpartisan in that instance, then was it at least politically insensitive at that time? Uh, the facts are, though I know they've been disputed, or let's say our motives have been disputed, the facts are that the book uh, was in work for a number of months. There was a discussion as to whether or not we should put it into print at the time we did. And this was before the Republican convention when the book went to bed. And uh, again, believe it or not, we truly did not believe that the Republican Party would nominate Barry Goldwater. And to that extent, uh, <coughs> it was an accident uh, that the book was committed to be printed uh, at that time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Shari. I appreciate your coming, and I hope you will keep me and my 27 million friends out of your next book. Thank, Thank you again. <laughs> <laughs>